Hi everyone, welcome to Banal Book Club where we discuss African centric literature and today um, we are joined by Chipo Korea. <laughs> yes, and this is your third time. Woo! Yes, and also second time we're reading a Zim. Actually, third time we're reading a Zim book, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, so and also to let people know if you haven't been if you have been watching it or haven't been watching, Chipo just doesn't turn up for the Zim ones. She, her first time was for the Nadif Mohammed book. Um, so yeah, it's not just a Zim attendance. Um, so <laughs> This this month we read, and I hope it's not upside down. If it is, I don't no. know. We read Glory by No Violet Bulawayo. Again, I'm probably butchering her last name. I apologize. Um, and Glory is a satire um, that is centered on the, I guess, Zimbabwean political um, revolution, uh, charting. Uh, a not specified Robert Mugabe, written in the style of George Orwell's Animal Farm. Um, and it follows a fictional country called Jidada, which is clearly based on Zimbabwe, as they transition from a very long tyrannical rule by an aging dictator. So, um, yeah, do, do you want, Katasi, do you want to tell me, you said, you were dying to tell me when we were reading this and I was trying to guess what you were going to say. Should I guess or should I leave it to you? Well, I messaged, I messaged you before to ask you a question because there's a quote, there's a, there was a, a phrase that she uses all the time and I was wanting to know what you thought it was. Yeah. Um, which is, what is it? It's um, Tolo Kuthi. Tolo Kuthi. I, I guess we've got the Zim person here. But that's assuming that she speaks in Debele, right? Yeah. Oh, is it a Dembele? What? Debele? I Not think Debele. so. Yeah. Okay. So look, well, yeah, I was listening to the last few pages and it's read by Chipo, Chipo Chang, actually. And yeah, Chipo Chang. Tilo. Tolukhuti or something. Oh, okay. That's how you pronounce it. That's helpful to know. Yeah. So this was a reoccurring um, word. She says it multiple times. It has different, like, it has different meanings in different contexts. And I just, at the beginning, I was a little bit confused. I was like, what is she saying? Like, what can we liken it to in Uganda? Yeah. And then I figured it out in the end without asking you, because you didn't come back to me. Yeah, because I hadn't read it yet. I had, I have like two of these because the first one I bought, for, they decided to deliver it to my neighbor or they went the other way around. So I went to open my door and it wasn't there. And then I had to reorder it. And then a few months later, or well, not a few months later, a few weeks later, I found it. So I'm like, well, let me keep my two books because, you know, they owe me money for another thing they didn't deliver. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, what were you going to guess that I was going to ask? I was going to guess, right, that maybe it wasn't something that took your fancy as much. Was it a tough, a bit of a tough read? Um, even though it was well put together, I was going to guess, because you were saying, you would, you said, oh, this book, da, 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 da. And I was like, oh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's, let's just... Let's... Let me just start. Okay, so um, I was just basically bursting to say how much uh, I was enjoying it. Okay. Oh, no. Hello, just oh, cut what? out. You're frozen. Yeah, it's pretty tough. His internet is really unstable, hey? Hmm, that's unusual. Chipo, did you read the book? Do you have it? Yeah, I was listening to it on Audible, to be honest with you. Fantastic. And um, and Chipo Chung was just having the best time narrating it, and I was having the best time listening to it as well. Um, it's a chunky piece of writing. It's big, and um, it's a book that I think... I was really happy to get through, but I think I'm going to be able to savor it and enjoy it that much more the second and third time going over it, you know, because um, especially because of how exciting the imagery is of like all of the different animals and the stories within stories and 
trying to piece together what my own remembrance is of history. And because it is a, a satire about Zimbabwe, I loved, I loved trying to think about where I was when certain things were taking place in history and placing my family members and aunties and uncles and cousins. It felt very close in a way that I don't normally feel close to so many stories. It was eerie. It was very, very eerie. Do you remember that book, um, Half of the Yellow Sun? Yes. So I remember reading that and there's that notion of, oh yes, war happens to, in other countries that whole all oh, Biafra, all oh, them. And then the same kind of notion with the Rwandan genocide. Oh, it's others. Um, and yet, when we think about Africa and what we've had to go through, there are so many wars, there are so many stories. And it was thrilling and exciting to sort of like get through the listening of it, but it felt close. Mm. Oh, I've missed, uh, that sounded really insightful. I'm so sorry. Um, so, so sorry. Uh, you were saying, Chipo? I mean, I don't know if I could verbatim say what I said again. <laughs> it's actually really beautiful, actually, but oh, yeah. Okay, we got it recorded, but um, could you give me a little, brief little summary, sorry. Yeah, I think I was probably just filibusting while you were doing your um, internet game, but mostly it just, Reading the book the first time, it was, um, I think it's a challenging book to, to read without context, without understanding, without history. And um, especially because it's satir satirical and because of the animal farm style and it's really, it's actually hard to read. Um, even though I, identify with the culture and I know so many of the key players and I have relatives and cousins and family members who are parts of the story it still felt it the word I kept using was close I, I, I think there are so many moments where I wanted to just do that just close up a little bit because of the exposing nature of the book and I think when we're living in the diaspora we keep going on about diversity in storytelling, tell our stories. But this is what happens when our stories are stalled, told. Um, it's greatly exposing. And um, our, our stories aren't told enough for us to really come to grips and sort of feel the weight of that truth and confront it often. It felt confronting. It must have felt exposing as well. Um, For sure. Oh, gosh. Yeah, really. And I think the example I gave to um, Katasi. Oh, has he gone? <laughs> Peace. Yeah, the example I've gave to Katasi before was of um, that amazing book, Half of the Yellow Sun, um, where the war is in West Africa. It's far away. Yeah, it's a black story, so you can get involved and feel connected, but you're not affected in that same kind of way. And the same with the um, the the stories of the Rwanda genocide and the plays that we've seen around that. I always find myself wincing when the Zimbabwean story because it's just so close, and it's it's not ancient history. This is very very recent. The ladies and the characters are tweeting <laughs> and Instagramming. Our country is very near my own age. <laughs> so it doesn't, so it is, um, it's close. It's, it, I don't, there's, there's, there's not other, another word that really feels more pertinent or more accurate than that. Yeah, I, I, I... Totally agree. Um, I think maybe that one of the big differences for me with Half of the Yellow Sun is that it was very, you know, Nigeria specific or West African specific, whereas actually uh, No Violet Blawayo makes a concerted effort to connect what's going on in Zimbabwe or Jidada to other nations, neighboring nations or even nations in Africa. So, you know, towards the end, she talks about the tyrants from Uganda, the tyrants from Nigeria, Cameroon, like all these different, you know, African countries that have had long lasting dictators. So she does make a 
a big effort to try connect it with us. And she mentions Uganda twice, actually. Um, so yeah, but I, I can, at least to a certain degree, um, relate to that being from Uganda, a country that's also had a long serving dictator. And also I was very, very, sorry, I'm jumping in here with my thoughts. I don't know if I'm, uh, Katasi, you managed to say your, your two cents. Thanks. Um, no, I hadn't had a chance to. Um, I, I, I actually really enjoyed this book. And I think that even before I read the acknowledgements at the end, um, it just feels like no Violet's writing for us, like she's writing for anybody who has experience or comes from a place where there's a an oppressive regime um, and like, you know, these long serving leaders. Um, and I think her stories have this universe, like this universality of them in terms of like, she's like, a Pan-African, I feel like she's a Pan-African writer and it was very close as well and for me I was just imagining what what how this would translate in our own context as Ugandans and it's such a fresh piece of work in the sense that no one, I don't know anyone else who's writing stories like this that are so contemporary and yet touching on the past and the present, the present and the future. So I just think it was a really skillfully um, written novel and really touching and, you know, just took me into different places, like emotionally, it was really powerful. I love the word you use there, skillful. Like that's why I am so looking forward to going and reading it again, because there's no, <laughs> I hate to be blasphemous, but just like the Bible, like every sentence felt like it was so deliberate. So like it was inspired and it felt like even when you were reading um, those motifs, even the way she took care of Jidada with a da and another da, like, and you could hear like, and feel the gentleness at times and then the assertion at, at other times and how, that country it was yeah you're right skillful very it was an ordinary storytelling yeah um yeah I, I i agree on the whole actually because i was really excited to read this book we read we need new names and you know i i think her character writing is so vivid and so rooted in kind of um reality like they're, they're so they're, they're fully realized characters and her world building is is so beautiful that I was really looking forward to it and you know I like you know I have a soft spot for Zimbabwe as well like just just randomly um personally I've dated um a couple of Zimbabweans so um I've always had that kind of yeah, yeah I've always had that kind of connection with Zimbabwe and um but yeah but then jumping into it I did it did take me a little while to um warm to it to, uh, to the, the sentence structures you know I love a good long sentence so I really wanted to kind of like keep um in line with what she was saying and sometimes if my focus dipped it was very easy to get lost but I think the really good thing is that it was beautiful sentences and beautiful imagery um there was a frustration for me when we never really maybe we did and I lost focus but we never found out where destiny had been and why she left. She wrote that story for her mum, but we never really got to read that story and understand. So I guess maybe she might have intentionally did that, or maybe she did tell us and that was just the part I missed. But yeah, I just thought it was, um, it was a very, very um, strong piece of writing. And at the beginning, I was thinking, no way can this be about, say, Robert Mugabe, like this can't be because she's taken an effort to, you know, change the country's name not make reference to it and then the more I was reading it the more I was going oh, okay yeah this is clearly Zimbabwe and then on top of that as well it made me and then maybe this is a sign of the good writing it made me want to research even more and you, you mentioned this Chippa where you said it requires the understanding of the context because I, I was ashamed when I was reading it I wasn't appreciating what I was reading at first because I didn't have that prior context so I went and I was watching document whilst I was reading it watching documentaries on 
the Zimbabwean independence. And then when I came back to it, I appreciated what she was writing a bit more. When she mentioned the Gukura Hindi um, massacre, I, I didn't appreciate the significance of that until I understood the history and the context and how significant that was. So it is definitely something that requires pre-homework, but also as well, um, it's something that maybe inspires further research. And I think that's a sign of good writing. Um, I was just gonna jump in and say, I also had to do some Google searches and watch a few documentaries. And I found out that Bob Marley performed at Zimbabwe Independence, which I, had, I didn't know. Um, yeah, but, I think he had a song called Zimbabwe. Did he? So, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know that. Um, I know what you mean about like wanting to know the finer details. For me, it was just, I was just intrigued because some of the stuff sounded so outlandish and I was wondering, is this um, just like no violence perspective or does this man actually wear a scarf in the middle of like the hot sun in a hot country? And, you know, I, I go and look and he actually is wearing this, the, the scarf. <laughs> um, and there were so many things I wanted to like look into into more detail, but then I'm also committed to finishing the book in time. So absolutely, it's something as I want to, to go back to um, at a later date. And I just wanted to say that I think someone's, some research has shown that reading, non, reading fiction um, encourages empathy. And I think this is like a book that does that really well, um, but, but evokes that because of all the, the, the past and the darkness. Was, was there anything in there, in there that, <clears throat> sorry, that, that um, was a little bit jarring or frustrating? I'll, I'll say, I think something that maybe, I wouldn't say frustrating, but that maybe I didn't appreciate as much or welcome as much might have been the repetition of some of the, you know, she would find, <laughs> For example, there was a section where, oh, it was, I, I really fit, uh, um, felt for the reader, um, Chipo Chung, because she would have had to say this a thousand times. Um, take, 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 yeah, 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 take, yeah, yeah, yeah. take, take, yeah, yeah. take, yeah. take, 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 take that one. And also when she says, I can't breathe. When she was saying, I can't breathe, yeah. um, in that sort of, in that George Floyd section, I was listening to it. And I thought, oh, I knew what was coming. I knew what was happening. I was like, oh, yeah, this is George Floyd. And she said, I can't breathe the first time, the second time, the third time. And I couldn't believe how many times I was hearing it. And then my chest started palpitating and I started to feel closed in and like under pressure. And before you knew it, I had to stop what I was doing mm -hmm. and wait for her to finish saying it. And I, I'm here for it. Okay. I'm here for it because effing listen. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how many pages of of I can't breathe it said on the it, it was in the book, but I am. Um, for me, it was it was perfect. I I, I really I appreciated that. Mm. Yeah, I guess for me, um, maybe again, uh, I had a different experience when you. I guess when you're reading it, when I was reading it. You know, you're going through, you know, a mammoth book and you're thinking, is this something we as me as a reader, I'm expected to read every single line in order to appreciate what she's saying. For example, when on page 390, when she talks about the crocodile, um, sorry, how he shook and smiled and shimmied and shook and whipped his tail and shimmied and shimmied and shook. Like there's a rep this repetition. And I guess it's creating a particular effect that maybe as a reader I didn't really kind of understand the purpose of it maybe when you're listening to it and the emotion when I was actually listening to there's another section where it was it was repeated and actually I appreciated it a bit more because I think it was to do with the revolution and it was like oh something to do with you know people there was a new revolution oh there was an and there was different emphasis put on each line um so that made me appreciate it a bit more than if I was reading it. I just kind of went, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. And then I move into the next section. I think it gave me a, because I'm listening to on Audible and 
I believe that if I was reading the book, I could have very much sort of scanned that page, seen that it says I can't re I can't breathe, and then just flicked it until the story continues. But having to hear it and hear it gave me an appreciation to again the skill and and the um and how she's a writer of this time that has an understanding and appreciation for where her book is going to end up. This is a book that is going to be read. It's a book that is going to be listened to. So somebody is going to have to sit and listen to that over and over again. And I don't think other books, especially as an early reader, I, I consumed books. You know, when you think about like, you know, you're sitting, getting through Harry Potter or like getting through this, because of the way this book has been written, I haven't got the option to just consume it and put it on my shelf and collect dust. I've got no choice but to do the extra research, to sit through the frustration and the heartbreak of like hearing I can't breathe over and over again, go back again for understanding and clarity and to pick out the nuance. So I think it just, yes, in some parts it was frustrating and annoying, and but then once I got through those feelings, I came back to the crux of what it means to not be able to breathe and what that means for me in the diaspora and what's that what that's meant for my mother you know with her trauma and what she's gone through having to fight against apartheid and like no know, knowing that my auntie was part of the military herself and what where she now like it really forces you to stop and really think about who really can breathe can any of us you know and really go through it like read every single one because she is the writer and she has put it there for a reason. And I think it's a great, it's a great show of sort of, um, not just skill and flair, but owning your space on the page to say that over and over again. And it's, a, and it's such a respect to that time in history and that person whose life, you know, George Floyd's life was a huge sacrifice and he's actually, his life has meant a lot. I, I, I go back and a lot of people, especially white people say to me, oh yeah, you know, during Black Lives Matter. No, not during Black Lives Matter because Black Lives didn't start to matter at one period of time. You're talking about at the time of George Floyd's death and his death has got to mean something and it's showing us that we were in such a connected world that his death meant something in sub-Saharan Africa where those people in the Americas may not have even known that they touched, but they were touched and we are touched and we are connected. So I'm, I'm here for the space that it, that it took up. Um, any, any thoughts on that, Katarsis? Um, I'll admit, I, I, I saw that how long some of those parts were and I just skipped over them. <laughs> However, um, I mean, kudos to her for taking up the space and it's just her, it's her creative license and I'm here for it too. Um, and I think some of the things that she was sort of, I don't know, like, um, for example, the take, the take, 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 it's just an emphasis on how long these regimes are and how much they are taking, it's, it's all quite symbolic. Like to take up an entire page, it's how, much, it's how much they're taking up in terms of how long we've been in power. Um, and I just don't think it was conventional, even in the way that she almost had this chorus with the country, the other country, like the, the digital realm and all the socials and the tweets. Um, that for me, I was okay with how unconventional it was. Like it just wasn't straightforward. You know, she included, even some of the phrases she was using, like um, those who know about things, it kind of felt like, you know, oral history, sitting around with your elders and hearing their stories. So I was just, I was just really open to it. Yeah, um, I guess maybe it's a, she, she might have got from me at least, um, her point was probably made by me scanning the I can't breathe or the take 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 and kind of going okay I get it I'm moving on because that's how easily we can ignore um it's such a serious situation as maybe a black a black man saying they can't breathe I wonder if I would have done the same thing if it was a say 
a traditionally um a traditional white writer was writing about a really difficult you know um historically white event would i have kind of went yeah i get it um and also the take 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 a good point uh katasi that it's kind of painting the picture of how much these regimes take but also by me ignoring it i'm kind of doing what maybe the the, the either the world or certain um aspects of society or certain areas of society do when these regimes take we just ignore because it's either we go well I'm, i've got what i got or what, what can i do what can i do like but actually the history of a lot of of course um um african kind of oppressed societies they have had these uprisings you know they've had these protests and resistance and yeah may, and, and i think it feels like the kind of book that's encouraging either conversation or it's encouraging kind of some sort of protest and resistance uh but then i had a question right you see these kind of books like do they really have a, that big of an impact on say bringing about a change like do, do you do you think someone will read this or a president will read this or would they even get their hands on it and go hmm this writer just said something about my country without actually saying my country maybe i should change or is it just something that contributes to the canon of whatever's being written about that a particular area i suppose for me the most important thing is that it exists and it is here and and the platform that you've created and the openness you've had to to read the book and the fact that we're able to talk about it now and and challenge even that moment of you sort of scanning over a page of i can't breathe or take 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 that single moment of revelation and acceptance and understanding that oh my gosh this is reflective of my position in society and how i've allowed and just you know walk past oppression dictatorship and colonialism and all that kind of stuff i feel like the most important thing has already been done in that it exists and it's out there because now in my own circle of influence i've got the opportunity to share the story with others and tell them about it and so have you and so has katasi you know um yeah that's my two cents but, but but don't you think the people that need like for example the army are the ones that decided okay we've had enough of you and stepped in and kind of staged this coup there it seems to be like the influential people they don't things only change once they decide okay we've had enough us who are aware of this already what impact do we have having read this like i can't go say to uganda and just demand and say okay that's enough get off the you know seat of power and let someone else the people that do have that impact sometimes don't read these books so they so it just makes me think what what influence and what impact do we have as as progressive or conscious people um who do want that change like is there anything we can do well, I think we are doing it. You are doing it in having started this book club. I am doing it in being an artist. And one of the biggest reasons that I am an actor is because I know the power of story. And I don't call myself a writer because that's not my skill. We know where the skill lies and it lies in No Violet's book. It lies in the books that we've read. But when we think about the masses, the masses are affected by narrative and story and empathy, just like Katasi said before, which they get through narrative stories, which is why it's important for me to go and book the job and tell the story and have someone in my likeness finally see it and understand it. When it comes to those people who are making the decisions, maybe, or at the point that I have my own influence or blue tick or structures or platforms, I can speak change to power but i can do that through the voice of someone who's done the work already and stopped to not think about policy building and government structures and put their energy into the satirical piece of work because they're doing the work that they can do and you're doing the work that you can do i will not feel despondent i can't afford to i haven't got the energy to feel despondent but i can come onto zoom and i can talk about this incredible piece of work 
and I can continue to do my piece of work. And we have to be filled with the hope that it exists. Um, I think it's a, I think they're really valid points, and it just reminds me of a question that I had, which was like, who's the audience? Like, who's the intended audience for this book? Um, and I don't, I'm not sure it's for people in power. I think it's just for ordinary people. And we've already had a spoiler, but like, I don't think we all had to be a destiny. Do you know what I mean? We don't all have to be destinies. We all have our role to play. Um, and I just, I think just even seeing our, these stories on paper and she had the saying in there that even every monkey, no, even a monkey falls from a tree, you know, um, as in, that's the message, like not to lose hope because every dog has its day. Is that the saying as well? I mean, I'm speaking in code and this is, this is I think this speaks to the book as well because when I was doing some re research, you um, know, Violet said, Zimbabweans speak in a lot of code. This is all very coded. Cause like we're saying something, I'm saying something, but I don't wanna say it in case people come for me. Um, but, the point is, I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's the people in power or like all the dogs that need to read this book for there to be change. Just writing it is enough. Just planting seeds of hope is, is, is something. I mean, I don't know what the call to action is. I don't feel like there is one. But Kalunji, I know you're different because you release music that's very out there and vocal and to the point. Yeah. But not, not everyone can do that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But it made me think, actually, and Zimbabwe is a perfect example of that. Once the defenders decided we've had enough is when the change came about. Because remember, all them years where they were content or maybe scared or whatever reason they had for not staging the coup or, or taking them out, they things it was business as usual. And even when, say, the average... Zimbabwean citizen went out and did the, the protests and all these things happened still he stayed in power and only once he was lifted up get up let's put someone else let's put the crocodile there that's when it changed and it seems to be like that's really the only way for that change to come about when it comes to African dictators I don't think of an, any other way it's it but I also think that this is the essence of the book. Like these com this very conversation we're having was echoed in this book through the, um, the various um, co like quotes that she got from individuals about, you know, the various voices. And there is, you know, I think she could just, I think No Violet breaks it down in a way that the change that we want, that we aspire to isn't even what we want when we do get it. So, you know, in the end, they wanted the old horse back because there was, it was no different. So what is it that we really want? You know, like, what does change look like? Change is so messy and it's so complicated. And even now, um, when you look at who's in power, there's, it's just a continuation. So these people are just symbolic. Is it possible, sorry, sorry Chippo to jump in, uh, you may have had a point, but is it possible that these people that, that say, people that yearn for the old kind of regime, sometimes it's just that feeling of familiarity. It's like when someone breaks up with their ex, their ex and then they get with someone new and they're like, oh, I miss, but it's just because of that familiarity. And then actually, if you allow for that transitional process to take its course, you find actually, no, you didn't want that. Because yes, of course, the, you know, the, the old horse, brought about so many different changes. He contributed, you know, he contributed to the independence, created a new country, but also there was other things that he did and could have continued to do that was so detrimental to your life that you shouldn't just be content with those little tiny crumbs you were given. You know, it's in the context of say, maybe it's controversial to talk about Uganda because we still have our, you know, our old horse, but it's a bit like, you know, with our current president, a lot of people talk about how he took the country out of a war, you know, like he, you know, um, there hasn't been that big of a war since he came into power. But then you have to look at the, 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 the corruption, you have to look at the, the kind of nepotism, you have to look at the exploitation of so many resources that Uganda has, just as, say, Congo, DRC could be the richest country in Africa, but then it's exploited and 
and corruption. Now you can say all the good things that that current president does or our current president does, but what about those big, big kind of um, exploitative things that they do? You know, surely they can't be trumped by the little tiny good things. I don't want to dismiss, of course, the, the great things that our president has done, but you know, there has, so maybe sometimes yearning for the old horses, just familiarity and not wanting to shake, you know, the pram a little bit. Um, uh, Chupa, did you have anything to say about that? Like in uh, more specifically, the kind of, I know you mentioned, you know, the impact of the book and impact of culture, but I still kind of, I'm, I, I really want to know if th there's more to it than that. Like if we need, you know, the defenders to also take their little shoes off and helmets off and because they're the ones that, that, that enforce this regime's kind of um, policies and stuff like that. Or am I just talking nonsense? You know, it's really tough when you are what I call a little leader. Like, and what I mean by that is someone who is, you know, visionary, entrepreneurial, and a leader in their own sort of sphere of influence. And I think a book like this speaks to us in little, as little leaders in that way. And the more little leaders that we have, the more of us that can come together and do something big. But I think Africa has gone through over a hundred years of dictatorship, of colonialism, of being told what to do, of forced language, like, um, like one of the worst words is corruption. It's used almost exclusively for Africans and I hate it because it was invented by and is still very Western. Like what's more corrupt than the UK government or even the American government? What is even more nepotistic than what's going on there? Did we not have brothers, you know, in the seat of power of the Labour Party very not long ago? Like it's, it's very corrupt and nepotistic and horrendous right here in the UK and right there in America. And for for words like corruption to be used so freely and easily with African leadership, I just, I, I take particular offense to that. But when people have lived a certain way for so long and they don't know what else could be, their, their, their only safety is in what currently is especially when there is the continued narrative of the other being so amazing. And that's why I can only keep going back to the fact that this book existing is the most important thing and the thing that we can continue to celebrate and hope to empower others by opening their sphere of understanding and opening their mind to what can be possible when they maybe don't have the access to it. And I just, I think my plight is how can we get the information and the books and the, and the perspectives to more people? It's, I don't, it's a rock and a hard place for me. <laughs> I just wanted to come in on the point around um, the corruption because, um, you know, I, 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 I skimmed through Goodreads to see what some certain people were saying about this book and um, someone said something similar to what you said around that this is not different to the West where you have um, all that you've described. But I think the difference is, and having like lived in Uganda, is that you percolate to make, like you can, it's easily, it's easy to percolate a nation like the UK because you've got basic things in place there's no power cuts you've got running water and fundamentally like those things aren't in place so that's why but they're not in place in Africa or in these other jadadas that we're you know that we're making reference to so until that's in place I just don't think we can not talk about the fact that money is being embezzled because we just don't have basic needs so you know in that particular scene where you know, Violet describes the line, the queue, you know, people are in the queue and they're queuing for ages and all that, and all. I just think you, we can't make comparisons until we're on equal footing and we're not. 
And, and, and Kalunji, I think we need to go back to um, Kakwenza's book, um, the one we didn't read, but, but Banana Republic or something, because he's basically talking, there's a line in there around um, ordinary Ugandans go to work every day to maintain, to, to run torture chambers and to maintain the existing structures. So it's not just the dogs, you know, it's all these ministries that she lists, like the Ministry of Homophobia, the Ministry of whatever. And I love that particular paragraph. You know, this is, these are institutions, this is not just about individuals. Like there's so much dismant dismantling that needs to happen. Yeah, and, and then, sorry, we're gonna to have to finish, but, um, and so to be that guy who says, so we we'll finish once I've finished talking, um, but I just wanted to jump in with the, your point, Chipo, about the kind of seemingly kind of um, exclusive use of corruption in context to Africa. The, on, the unfortunate thing is, at least maybe in certain, certain Western countries, when people are corrupt, they are held accountable. Um, there is systems in place, you do have, journalists that can expose those corruptions and can continue to do so and people lose their jobs and you know there's reputation to a certain degree of course they can continue and go off and do other things um, in the private sector but whereas in places like Africa someone says someone if someone writes about for example Museveni being corrupt they're really putting their life on the line and they have to escape and they have to worry about their country uh, sorry their well-being um, so like I think Katas, like you said, there were certain things that are in place in the West where corruption maybe sometimes isn't always associated with them, maybe erroneously, like you just said, Katasi. I'm oh, sorry, I'm Chipo, but I just feel like until people stop exploiting, and then not only just say uh, Western people, but also African residents and maybe us, the diasporans, until we stop exploiting, um the resource resources in africa in whatever form they are i think corruption is always going to be associated with us because i probably benefit from nepotism in uganda i benefit from being Brit british and going into uganda and getting certain perks so which an african wouldn't get coming to the uk for example um so i guess my point is i i i think maybe the new point I'm making is the people that need to read these books, they might never get to read it because we are maybe where the, the, the convert, she's preaching to the converted. We already have these thoughts and, and opinions. And how do we get the defenders, the Ministry of Violence members and those kind of people to read this? Because then, then they'll decide one day, you know what, I don't want to be part of this and step out. Yeah, we have to to be brave for sure. Oh, he's gone. Um, yeah, it's okay. We have to be brave for sure and find ways to shove the book in in their faces and stuff. But I don't know. Maybe it's because I was born in the UK and I'm so offended and hurt by the way it's treated me that I maintain that this country is corrupt and Jimmy Savile and whatever all of these other people they've been protected and they've continued to do evil things so you cannot tell me that corruption is something that is exclusive african because we haven't got um water supplies um we've been exploited by the people here and um and that's where the responsibility for me lies and until we get our bones back until we get our gold back when we get our things and we're left alone to our own devices then we can maybe do a better job of trying to figure it out but unfortunately we still live in that world of the grass is greener i'm still here in the uk because i'm trying to make enough money so i can go home and ensure that i do have a generator so that i can do self tapes and so i can earn money so i can live i get it it's hard and sometimes it's easier to blame and point fingers at whoever's closest and who's in leadership. And they have made mistakes. I'm not denying that mistakes have been made and that they could have done a better job. But I just, I know who I place that responsibility on and there are policies that are put in place in this country that have meant that Africa has had to suffer more than it needs to. And in Africa, we can talk about how 
there's no people paying for it but when anything happens in the west they'll blame it on shell company or bp has done this or mcdonald's they get to hide behind logos but they will always find a black face to put against something bad that happens in africa which is another way of looking at the bias and how that we're still hated by the west we're not taken care of it's not equity it's it's there's no um there's no fairness there but mm. i have to live with the hope and say that we're doing the work that we can do by being here right now. Okay, just last words from me. This has been a really intense and heavy discussion when this book is actually quite funny. And um, my favorite bits, these are my last words, are the parrot that just keeps um, chanting the new, the new sort of um, propaganda message, new, dis new disposition, and the fact that um, the, the savior talks to Siri like Siri's like, oh, is actually a real person like that was just so funny for me there were lots of laugh out loud moments for me so like it was really heavy but still she just found so much like places like opportunities to be humorous and just on your last note around the corruption um people in the book would just be sent to prison and then just be <laughs> come out the next day <laughs> sorry if no one understands what I'm saying, but I just thought it was a funny book too. Oh, good. Well, good, um, good place to end it. Um, so I look forward to all the different kind of awards, nominations and winnings she's going to get. And I hope more and more people get to read this book and we're all inspired to bring about the change that we know is deserving of not only Africa, but all other nations that have got their own uh, Jidada structure. Um, so yeah. So thank you, thank you, Chipo, again for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, and I think we're we're gonna have a little break because. Um, no, can you we're reading one more book? Oh yeah, yeah. Time. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm uh, keen to have a break. I am very keen to have a break. Um, yeah. So so we're reading one one, and that's the uh, the Ghana book, right? The yeah, it's the Ghanaian book. One for joy, one for sorrow. That's it. Yeah. So that's. Yeah. That's We've got advanced reading copies of that. So if you don't have a copy, you can't read it. You are, no, but there's always, I'm sure there's always free Kindle versions. And yes. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, really looking forward to reading that. Um, Thank you, people. Thank you for sharing so candidly. Yeah, yeah. Really appreciate it. Okay. All right. Have a good uh, weekend, rest of it at least, and uh, speak soon. Bye. Okay. Bye guys, thank you so much. Bye.